We found one, guys. We found another one. We found another playable character in this sea of non-playable characters and people looking around, head in their phone, memorizing things in school, memorizing mainstream media talking points and political talking points. We found another playable character, someone who could think for themselves. So I hope, I really sincerely hope, you enjoy this session with Dante Cook, one of my favorite people in the Bitcoin space. I uh, met Dante almost a year ago and he took me uh, under his wing, uh, literally and physically, and uh, we spent a lot of time together at the first Pacific Bitcoin. He works for Swan Bitcoin, business development there. So if you know anyone in the business world who has a company is looking to involve themselves into the sound money and freedom space with Bitcoin, get a hold of Dante. He is one of the deepest thinkers in Bitcoin that I know of, and he hasn't been in the public scene very much, but he's becoming more public now, and boy, is that a treat for all of us, and do we all get to benefit because of that. So I hope you enjoy this hour with Dante. Please let me know what you would like us to dive into more, because we are certainly going to dive in more into specific topics with him in the future, because he's one of the smartest people out there. You'd be surprised with the athletes in the Bitcoin space that I know are some of the deepest thinkers out there. So I hope you enjoy. Dante Dante Cook, this playable character we have found, and we'll see you at the end. Enjoy. Mr. Dante Cook, thank you, brother, for being here with me today. I appreciate you more than you know. So thank you. Thank you for giving us some of your time today. No doubt. Glad to be here, Brandon. How you doing, man? Good, man. Really good. Uh, and just quick backstory on Dante. Dante took me in at Pacific Bitcoin, my first conference last year. So I'll be eternally grateful to him and uh, brothers from another mother, as we said right away, just I, we we hit it off even before before we even got there, I guess. Right. We were kind of talking, you just hit, hit it off. And then, uh, you know, just obviously you've shown up and then you brought me in, literally brought me in under your wing. Let me stay in the in the suite you had and stuff like that. So I'm uh, just very grateful for that. And uh, just again, shows the kind of person you are. There's a lot of Bitcoiners that I think are are like that, but uh, it just shows the kind of character and the person you are. So I, I just appreciate that. Yeah, man. And I think uh, it was fun just having you there uh, with the team, the Swans, like at the hotel, all of our events and all those things. I think you, um, you know, you, you, you bring a lot of value. You bring a different, you know, perspective. And I think, you know, what's common amongst Bitcoiners, uh, but maybe not so common amongst kind of the average person in the world is just you speak your mind. You've got an opinion, you've got a perspective, you you have um, a vision of where you think the world should be and where it should go in terms of raising kids, in terms of, you know, political ideology and those things. And I think um, there's so much that's dictated onto people, um, whether it's from a politician or some person that's literally not even elected there or they're appointed by some person that we elected from other, some other person we elected. It's like three levels of people that control us who we don't even know. Um, and, and so I think that stood out for me uh, about you just like early on. Uh, and so, yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, no, well, well said the, the bureaucracy runs deep, the, the committee of 300 uh, picking our rulers and, and, and ruling us, uh, so we, ironically, we just had on, um, I jumped on space. I told John yesterday, cause I was interviewing John, you know, her, uh, one of your, one of your boys. And, um, and so he was, you know, doing the space this morning and we were just having this political fight, actually, <laughs> not a fight, right. But it was a bunch of the guys, we were just going around round tabling, just libertarians, uh, you know, kind of not being involved in politics and, and, and it, should we, should you do your, does your vote even count? So everyone's kind of going at it for like 20, 25 minutes before we jumped on here. So. Um, well, 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 you know what? Like, I'll say this, like for the first time, I texted one of my boys the other day um, for the first time in my adult life, even in college, because like when I was 18, um, I, I, I voted like when I was in college and that was a year that Obama became president. And I think just for like a lot of different reasons, like I just voted like Obama because I just I, 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 I had a you know, my parents were Democrats. Even though they both served in the military, you know, fought in the Gulf War, the Desert War. I was born in Germany. Wow. Um, and, and so, you know, and I just like voted Obama. But for like most of my adult life, I'm talking about post-college. I've just been mm -hmm. kind of malaise, I think, a little bit with with politics. And I was listening to Stanley Druckenmiller's uh, USC address. He just addressed their, their Marshall School of Business students. 
And one of the people asked him, like, what, what's your advice for uh, anyone who's 25? Like, what would you advise them to do? Like, how would you advise them in their life and their career? He's like, look, you guys are, you you guys need to be as woke about our leaders and politics as you are about, you know, climate change. Um, and he said, if I was you, if I was 25 and, you know, everyone's talking about the debt ceiling, um, you know, they're talking about how this, you know, 20 foot wave 30 yards out is going to destroy this pier that we're standing on, not recognizing the 200 foot tsunami that's a couple hundred yards out with the entitlements and social security and the liabilities that we have. Wow. He's like, man, like our two political candidates are, are you know, Joe Biden, who's going to run uncontested probably. Uh, and then you've got Donald Trump, like and Ron DeSantis, like, if our best four are Robert Kennedy, Joe Biden, Ron DeSantis, and Donald Trump for the office of the greatest organization, country, thing in the world, then we've got real questions. We've got real issues. And so that this is like the first time in my life where I've ever considered like, like hey man, how do I actually be involved beyond like a local level, mm -hmm. beyond my local school board, beyond my you know, my mayor, my governor, that impacts me like on a national level. How do I use my voice to actually impact change at that level? And so, yeah, I don't know if it's learned hopelessness, like, hey, man, I don't know if my voice even counts, kind of what you were talking about. But I realize that there's a lack of leadership. It's not a lack of everyone. Yeah, well said. Like the 13 year old girl at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, Dude. Like, she came on and brought the fire. And it's like everyone can articulate the problem. But there's a lack of leadership and like backbone to implement the problems and say, look, hey, we're going to do this and this is why. And here's who's going to be impacted. Like, yeah, we're going to have to make cuts for seniors. I know we promised this for 50 years, but here's how we're going to try to help you. Here's how we're going to get through it as a country. Like the decision is obvious. Yep. Somebody has yep. got to cut these entitlements. But who's going to make the decision and stand in front of the bullets when they fly after you make that decision to get it done? Right. So lack of leadership. I've never cared about politics, but no, I need to get involved. Well, and to your point, I mean, the local politics, like you said, it's I love that you said that because not many people even mention that. Not, not many people even like realize that local politics is a thing. And truly, all politics is local, actually, ironically. And it's like I always like tell people that um, or suggest to people, I guess, you know, hey, if you if you go to one PTA meeting a year, if you go to one you know city township meeting a year and, and only 10 percent of people did that, 20 percent of people, you'd have change, you know, within a year, you're, you, everything would look very different. And that was my my argument with the libertarian thing in in the spaces earlier was, you know, I've known libertarians for thirty years. Like I grew up around many, but a lot of them never voted. And the, the ironic part was they were like hunters. You know, they were conservationists, not environmentalists, right? They were actually conservationists, like real people that cared for the the planet. They'd plant, they'd grow, they'd hunt. You know, they fish real like human beings, real Americans. Like, <laughs> and, yeah. and they wouldn't be involved in politics. They wouldn't vote. And it, as a kid in the nineties growing up, I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. Like you don't vote like, and it wasn't the whole, like, you know, Oh, these people died for your country. So you need to do that. Hey, we're all free to do what we want. And that's why people serve. So people can make those choices. Right. So that's not the argument to me. The argument was to me is you better be involved or else you are going to have the government. The thing you don't want is the very thing that will happen. And we're living that, you know? So my argument was sure. have libertarians given the country, the hundred million people or whatever that don't vote every year, those those people that don't want to be bothered have actually caused themselves to be bothered. And I think that was the whole my whole argument. And that like, you know, Ant had said something and then it spun a little about, you know, into like out of control, didn't mean to go down this loop. And then I said something and then just spun in this whole like 25 minute debate. And and, and everyone's on the same side. And like you said, you can diagnose these problems, but unless you're involved and like you said, like, hey, I I got to start actually really getting involved, not just like, oh, I know some candidates, but like what is actually happening here and saying something like you said, not being silent in the face of evil and nothing's going to change otherwise. So it, it really I mean, it's a fascinating talk. We could talk about that for hours alone, um, which <laughs> maybe <but> next time. <laughs> next time we could talk about. Uh, boy, oh boy. Um, so anyway, you can touch on any of that if you want. But also I wanted to get into some of your backstory and just, you know, like what what kind of led you down that road to like, like you said, you weren't involved in politics at all 
um, you know, money, what was your story of money as a kid, even growing up, you know, you said your parents in the military. So what was that story like for you as kind of growing up you into athletics, obviously, um, what was that whole story like? And then this transformation, like you said, to like being you know, more like, Hey, I got a little more into, into money and, and into politics and, and really taking ownership and uh, the responsibility problem we have in the country, you seeing that at that level and having uh, obviously a, a vantage point that not many people have, um, talk about that, just kind of that story. Yeah, I, I would start to, I would say, I mean, one for all the people that who are, who are anxious about like not figuring out who they are, their unique role, their ikigai, right? Uh, being in the middle of the circle of what the world needs, what your passion is, what you love, what you can get paid to do. Like I'm I'm 32 going on, well, 33, dang. Uh, damn, I just had a birthday a week ago and forgot, literally last Friday. Right. Uh, so that's the life of a parent with four kids. Uh, but uh, I just turned 33 and I'm just now starting to figure out like my unique story, my unique background. I talk about living on the hyphen and I really believe this. So, you know, my my parents, my family, um, they, they grew up that one. They had great parents, loving parents, but they grew up like pretty relatively poor, like lower means. But they didn't like that wasn't like a, a part of their story. They didn't like victimize. No one in my family is a victim. Right. I'll put it that way. And so my dad's the only person to leave Philly. Um, he got his GED the day he turned 17, enlisted in the military. My mom grew up with, you know, 20 of her family and siblings like, like in one house, like on a farm. But there was like 20 of them in like one house. And she didn't have her own bed until she was like nine or 10 years old. Hey, really quick, I want to annoy the hell out of you with a quick little break to just remind you that we have to share the signal within the noise because the algorithm hate truth. Algorithm hates truth. So we have to do all that we can to spread the signal. The faster we do that, the quicker change comes to the world. We need to be the change we seek to be. What are we doing? What am I doing? What are you doing to build a future? Also, if you want a written version of a lot of what we do here, please go to the description and find the link to our, our blog, our Substack, as well as you will see many links to the either the work or the companies the places you can find all the playable characters here that we talk to and how you can connect with them. So now back to the show. Thank you. She always slept with, you know, one of her siblings. And so, you know, they grew up humble, hardworking, but with like loving families. And she went to the military when she turned 18. And so they got to travel the world. That's where they started our family. They had met a little after. And so I was born um, in Germany. They were in the Gulf War at the time. And so that was kind of like, you know, my story, but my parents were like entrepreneurial. They were the first people to leave. But I also recognized, you know, they were the only people to leave like in their family. So this kind of entrepreneurial take risks, you know, work hard to provide your kids with a different future in life than you had. I got to see that pretty early. Um, and I, what I mean by this living on the hyphen thing is I've been able to see multiple perspectives. What is it like to, uh, grow up poor or like being in an African-American context where, you know, um, there aren't a lot of opportunities or, you know, you have family members that are in jail or that are in prison or struggle with those same things. But then me now, like I just interface with, you know, really affluent, really rich, rich people, like really successful people, Fortune 500 CEOs, publicly traded CEOs, like mm -hmm. that's my world. And so to have that perspective of, what is that like to, you know, what is the other side like? Or even my, my own family, like parents that love me and had a really loving childhood. But, you know, my dad, you know, he'll tell this story. Um, he became addicted to drugs, like became a drug addict and got divorced after being married for 20 years. And so I understand the like uh, um, drug addiction and loving family. Um, being a first generation college student. So my parents didn't go to college, but mm -hmm. I went to William and Mary, like second oldest university. And I ended up yeah. getting you know, three, three degrees there or three majors, marketing, finance, and consulting. And, you know, even in my athletic career, um, you know, I got the fortunate, you know, side to go play division one, you know, football and, one of the most interesting things about my career is I've played with like 14 guys who were like high level, you know, pros, you know, some of them still playing. And I was just as talented as they were, you know, if not more. And, you know, I got injured. Like I just like my career didn't continue to evolve like post collegiately. 
for some of those reasons, but I I can resonate with those guys. Like I call any one of them and they'll pick up the phone. And so like, I understand, I think because I'm able to relate to them and they respect me, like some of their challenges as a professional athlete, but then I'm also a high school football coach. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm on, so like, I just like live I, another kind of, this is a more personal thing. You know, my, I'm, I'm African-American. My wife is white and we have four mixed children. Right. Um, we live in, um, I would say, a, a lower income side of the town, but we, we have like a nice house and like live in the midst of, you know, violence and gun shooting and other this. So I like, I live on the hyphen, I would say of people that are struggling with like real problems or real things or undereducated to really educated to playing at the highest level to like high school kids that are like lucky to make the team. Um, and so I'm starting to live into this reality of I can be a unique voice or a bridge mm -hmm. across the aisle on a lot of different things. Um, and so, you know, I don't quite have it all figured out, but I'm starting to like really live into this identity of, you know, I'm not this, but I'm also not that, but I can, I can, I can tell you a great deal about both. Yeah. And that's why, boy, I, I started the whole thing off with, I just think you have a un very unique vantage point and you, uh, you nailed that. That's uh yeah, well, you laid that out beautifully. And that's, there's not many people that have that, uh, vantage point to be able to see both sides. And I think that one of the, um, one of the the definitions, I guess you could say, of of genius is is being able to see both sides of an argument, or being able to think opposing opinions at the same time and holding them in your head. Um, and and one of those definitions, in a way, of genius is is, is you. You know, is being able to see, hey, I can see both sides of the spectrum. So you have this like worldly vantage point that not many people have, and that's because a lot of what happens in society, the polarization, division, hate, or whatever is is a lot is just seeing that one side right it's only seeing your side and not being able to see the other side so it's just it's wild like the perspective you have in so many areas of your life and it, it it's followed you throughout your career obviously like you just laid out of of your entire life and and going through and just seeing being able to see that side so that's why i think so many people get along with you and you you get along with so many people because you see everything you know and very few people have that so it's it's Boy, so cool. Um, that that could be a whole episode in and of itself too. Um, what what was your introduction to to money? You know, like as a kid growing up, stuff like that. Because we do, I'm helping the you know the Bitcoin trading cards team a lot, and you know, we're working at, on education. Swan works on education, obviously a ton. It's huge, huge, huge. Obviously, what is money? Getting kids to understand what's going on, the younger generation, stuff like that. I've books I'm working on, kids books we were talking about earlier. Um, and just helping to educate the youth. We have a bunch of young kids, obviously both of us. So what was your introduction to money as a kid? And, and where were those first times? Where is it when you were five, when you were 15, the way you were kind of like, huh, like interesting. What was that like? Yeah, my my family, they were like, and it's so interesting uh, now to see them like much older, but you know, we were just visiting my mom and she kind of has like her dream house and her dream home uh, in North Carolina. And it's like a cabin. She's got like, I don't know, five or six acres of land. She's got trees. She's got all the, you know, it's near like right. It backs up to a water. And, but my mom, and this is just, I think more of a product of like her growing up and even my dad, like they just saved a ton. You know, I wouldn't say that we were, <clears throat> excuse me, without like experiences and events, but we were like, my parents were very practical in terms of like the money that they made and even ended up working two jobs. So they, they both worked for the post office. Um, and then they actually delivered newspapers from 2 AM to like 6 AM for like five years of my childhood, like wow. every morning uh, other than Sunday when the paper didn't run, but they would get up at 2 wow. AM and deliver newspapers to make extra money for us to save and for us to like start a life in um, that, like working hard to save, was definitely something implanted into me. Wow. Um, but I think there's also things now that as like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a parent. Um, I'm a voracious, like saver, like in, in Bitcoin, like I've got DCA. I like, I probably mm -hmm. over invest in things <laughs> sometimes to the detriment of like, Hey bro, it's okay to like spend a thousand dollars to <laughs> rent an Airbnb and go, you know, take uh, your that's why we get along. Same. Yeah. You know, so it's yep. like, uh, I, I, <laughs> There's some, well, you, there's you, you some see the value in working hard up front though, right? It just, that's, yeah. 
Yep. I'm trying to learn more of experiences and memories and those sort of things because, you know, I, looking back now, you know, we, we got to take uh, our kids to Disney World on this micro strategy. We were down there in Orlando for the micro strategy world event. And I just brought the family with us and we went that Monday to Disney World. And I'm think I'm sure that's an experience that they just they won't oh forget. And it's like it's not cheap. Uh, yeah, but it is a memory for sure that we will have and cherish. So it's that balance yep. of like saving every penny. <laughs> yes. Um, and experiences versus, oh. versus spending on experiences. So that's, that's so true. That's yeah. Well said. And that's, it's funny. I think you get to probably that early thirties, mid thirties. And you start thinking about that a lot. It's more like uh, Jessica and I we were just talking about that before, uh, or like in the last couple of months, even like we don't, like we don't really get each other a presence anymore. Like, you know, birthdays and like, why? Like, I don't need anything. Like, I don't need yeah. anything from you. Like if we need, if you truly need something like, Hey, can we, like, let's get this or whatever. But it's like, we need to spend on experiences, you know, like for us and you know, the kids or whatever, like it's gotta be like something that's going to be a memory. Like we don't need another piece of plastic, you know, something from China. And like, who cares? You know, like, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> wild. Really. It's just a different mindset. But I think it's shifting. I think, I think the younger generations, even people that aren't in Bitcoin, I think are seeing that, right? Like we're, we are products of the 08 crash, you know, seeing what happened a few years ago. And a lot of us are just kind of like, you know, we see what's happening on social media. There's a lot of great stuff with social media, right? The decentralization of like news and, and stuff like that. But there's the, the ill effects of it too, right? Which I think a lot of us are seeing like, hey, you know what? Like we need to focus more on like being present, being in the real world. So I know a lot of people I'm around at least, and a lot of Bitcoiners, they talk about that. And I know I'm sure I've seen for you too, but um Man, yeah, it's just really interesting. Um, so, so getting into money and learning how to work. By the way, as well, this is why your podcast Proof of Work, as that gets going, is going to be great because you're you're going to be great with that because it's you are you are built for that and just showing everything to me comes back to Proof of Work as well, which I know is the name of the podcast and that's I think it's so important for this time because you like your parents and. I don't even know if anyone does it anymore. Like working multiple jobs like like that in that way, or like I'm going to get up at 2 a.m. and do that. I mean, it's like you can't even look at the the roles anymore, the stats to even see what's going on anymore. But it, none of it makes sense. They've they've screwed us so much of it. But boy, it's just like that used to be the American way, and now it's just completely lost. So I mean, kudos to your parents. Boy, oh boy, they set a great example. Um, today, what in saying that to you? What what do you think we're missing as a society? I kind of opine on what I think, but what are your thoughts just on kind of the current state of the world? I mean, what do you think we're missing uh, in terms of people and you know characteristics of uh, what makes a good society? Yeah, the um, the one of the most interesting things that I think I I'd read. I mean, I'll speak to the United States context because I don't want to be uh, arrogant and, and assume that I know what the rest of the world needs. I think in my conversations with in my role, like at Swan, you know, I'm I'm the head of our business group. And so I have conversations with blue collar businesses, you know, service based companies to, you know, white collar based companies, you know, lawyers, you know, accountants, other people that have different vantage points and then larger corporations as well. And so I really do. I think I probably get a wider canvas than most people. And so I, I, I will speak on what I think America needs in terms of uh, money and work and those sorts of things. And so there was an interesting quote. Um, there's a guy named Morris Chang. He's one of the founders of the Taiwan Semiconductor Company. Mm. And they're building up their manufacturing in Arizona and in Texas. And, you know, we're trying to insource chips and things here to America. That's one of the big um, things that we're trying to become less reliant on China on. In an interview, he said, look, we're going to build to the greatest ability that we can, our facilities like we build them over in Taiwan. But there's a few reasons why it's not gonna work the same and it's not gonna be as cheap here. Because no one in America is willing to get up, leave their family in the middle of the night to come serve a customer support or service problem at one of our factories. You guys demand too much, you, 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 you have too many entitlements. And so what it took to make Taiwan Semiconductor, the, one of the greatest companies in the world, was a lot of sacrifice and a lot of people being really bought in to serving by any means at any cost. And so he said, we're going to build chips here, but it's not going to be the same. And so one of the things in that is, I think America, we need to get back to, um, I think Jeff Booth's book, you know, talks about deflation. And when you think about AI and you think about 
math, the fundamental open source language that we all can relate to around the world, right? If you put nine pieces of something on a table and you add one, it doesn't matter what language you speak, we're all going to get to 10, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. there's a base layer yep. that we know is truth in math. And so as computers become more decentralized, as artificial intelligence becomes stronger, right? Deflation says that white collar skills are going to diminish to the cost of production. And so as that happens, right, we've got to get back to the real world. We've got to get back to building things. We've got to be able to get back to making things. We talk about a housing shortage. No reason that there should be a housing shortage, right? Yep, and yep. Th there's there's no reason that we can't go find new ways to build houses. We've been building them the same way for 50 years. <laughs> and so there's, I think, Morris Chang, Taiwan Semiconductor, what does America need? What is the work we need? And how does that impact money? I think we're just going to be in this weird bounce right now where technology is deflationary. Uh, we're, we're dealing with an inflationary currency, but we don't have enough skills in the hard world, the manufacturing skills to create that GDP or that surplus to offset that deflationary pressure. So it'll be interesting, man. As soon as I seen chat GBT come out with a Drake song, uh, I said, man, I better figure wow. out how to pick up a shovel. Uh Dude. You might have a platinum record here in a few years, brother. You could just come up with a Drake album, you know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. He's got the IP, but uh, man, oh, it's man. Uh, that, that's what I think, man. That's what I think the big shift is yep. happening in America that we need to build capability to, you know, made in America. I don't agree yep. with all the accounting tactics and all the gimmicks and stuff I think they do at Tesla, but you can't deny yep. the fact that they built a world class company in the United States with American people, with American IP and American technology. And so yeah. we need more of that. We need more defense technology. We need more uh, utility type technology. And so anyways, that's my uh, kind of thought on what I see from a work and money perspective in America. Yeah, beautifully said. I I, I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, I forget who it is now, but someone they always talk about, you know, WTF happened in 1971. That site obviously is always talked about a lot in Bitcoin circles. One of the charts I find most fascinating on there, though, is the explosion of you know attorneys, the explosion of you know hospital administrators, um, I think doctors even, you know, just an explosion of um, just all these different worlds. I'm sure real estate agents, stuff like that, was a world I used to be in, um, you know, uh, in doing. And so all these, like you said, the the marginal production cost goes to zero. You know, like, why would I have a CPA when I can just type my problem into chat GPT and get, and, and get all the answers I need right away or, or a lawyer or whatever. I mean, that, that is coming a lot quicker than most people think. And it's getting back all those people that were in those worlds now will be, like you said, building homes. They actually be swinging the hammer. They actually be doing things that actually provide real work and value and in creating beautiful things, you know, getting back to someone saying the other day, like, I want like just a beautiful chair, you know, like, can someone make me a beautiful chair, you know? And it's true though. Like it's, it's going to be back to like work and actually providing and getting back to this world where you're providing this authentic, true value and service for people. So I think it's going to be in products. So I think it's going to be, man, really interesting. I was going to ask you, what's the most important thing you've seen from or heard from some business leaders, but that, that quote by Morris Chang just kind of like gave me chills that uh, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So I think we, uh, we kind of hit that. Um, what do you, what do you, uh, switching a little bit, but what do you think, um, is the reason I'm going to I'll have some pointed questions in a way, but what do you think are some of the, uh, the most important things for uh, kids to learn in school or when they're growing up, um, as children, like, what are some of the things that you wish you would have learned younger? Um, it could be money, uh, it could be thinking critically, you know, things like that. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on just kind of like skills that, uh, you know, that aren't, aren't taught in, in school generally growing up, or a lot of our parents just didn't, you know, teach us because they didn't know, right? They were, they were taught by a certain system and then they, they just passed down. They, they did the best with what they had. And so what are your thoughts on that? I've given that a lot of thinking over the years, but what are your thoughts? Man, I think you got to zig while others zag. And so as you think about these technologies and these capabilities of um, growing in capability, like from AI and chat GPT, I think like what I want my kids to learn is, how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to um, be empathetic, um, how to uh, influence people and outcomes and situations in the real world. 
um, how do you navigate situations in the real world? Because as I think about what where technology is going, right? One, um, I, I heard a Kevin Kelly um, interview and he said, AI is actually uh, uh, um, an individual personal intern. And so what I've learned about AI and what I think our kids should learn in opposite of that is the people who are going to be able to get the most out of technology moving forward are the people that can ask the best questions. So when you think about an API, you know, an API is an interface that uh, application programming interface that allows you to talk to different systems. And so what you're doing with an API call, you're making a request, you're asking a question. Um, when you're talking to chat GBT, like you're asking it a question. And so the people that can literally identify what questions to ask and then how do I mobilize people in order to implement that thing from the questions I asked are going to be the most successful. It's not actually the person who fundamentally knows the most about math, who knows the most about these base technologies, because again, deflationary forces, it's all going to zero. It's all going to that base level uh, that we can all access. And so what I want my kids to be learning, how do you deal with the kid next door? Like uh, you slap them in the face. It doesn't matter if it was an accident. You need to say that I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, how do you feel when I slapped you? Like those are the like small pieces, the empathy, the humanity that I think my kids need to learn more so than hard STEM technology. Interesting. I, and I think that I, I've just been thinking about this a lot too. And I love that answer. Uh, it's um, I just thinking a lot about schooling in general and, you know, homeschool, uh, private school, you know, versus public school. And, and just, you know, it, we're, we're on the fence. I mean, we, 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 we feel like we should be homeschooling. We have our little one in, in a, in a Catholic school and um, it, it's just, it's like the, the, best situation for now but just still something just feels off um and it's just like you know you're trying to get that situation right where it's like yeah we really should be at, at home school and i just think a lot about curriculums for kids and there's the Tuttle twins out there. there's a lot of different stuff out there children's education because it's actually a very nascent industry like overall uh there's homeschooling curriculums but it's just very nascent so i think those are awesome things you talked about because there's such a important things for kids to learn and you can tell that a lot of the uh millennials you know, and really above probably and, and Gen Z too and above it just very few people have learned those skills, empathy, collaboration. I mean, you're taught to do none of those things in school. Like you don't communicate, you don't collaborate. It's cheating, you know, as Robert yeah. Kiyosaki would say. Right. And there's, it's, you know, how to influence people. Like there's no negotiation or influence in school. It's just kind of like, Oh, the teacher said no, you know, or there's only one answer. So yeah, yeah just brilliant, brilliantly said um, in, in that same vein, what, what did you, uh, you know, study just even, you know, growing up and getting, kind of getting into the Bitcoin space as a kid, who, who are some of your, you know, like, what were you reading, um, you know, growing up? Uh, what are you reading now and leading into like, what was that transformation like into Bitcoin? And, you know, how you got into that, into the Bitcoin space coming from athletics and then into the, the Bitcoin world and where, what you're doing now. Wow. So you're, you're, uh, you're touching on, um, a couple things there. So I literally, I'm trying to remember. So I, for all of you all who are like younger than 25, there was this fast food chain called uh, Pizza Hut. <laughs> and they had <laughs> reading programs where if you like read certain books, you would like, you'd get like, uh, like free pizza nights and stuff like that. Yeah. They did that through school, didn't they? Or something. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Little Caesars had one. It was like yes. all the unhealthiest places like got you in the door by like <laughs> making you read. Brilliant marketing. So funny. Yeah. All the loyalty reward programs are completely backwards now. Yep. Um, but I honestly think even with those sorts of things, I probably read like 10 books by the time I graduated high school. And I came to William & Mary and, you know, it's, it is like one of the toughest academic schools like in the yeah. country. Um, and so you walk in the door and the first time like a professor, so a, a student asked professor like why? And I'm sitting in the back, lean back like, Oh, well, it's because he said that's what the answer was. And they're like questioning their answer. You like you wake up like, yo, there's people here that are really thinking on a different level. And so I think going to William and Mary um opened my horizons on 
the type of people striving for something different than like sports or athletics. Like that was kind of my world growing up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so that was the first opener. And then I met a guy, I, I always tell him, thank you. Um, he, he was an entrepreneur. Uh, he worked for NASA for 15 years. He then created the first mobile app company called app forge, uh, sold it to Oracle in 2007. I think he was a little early. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but he, he basically told me when I was there, um, he said, Dante, like, don't work for, don't do any electives uh, while you're here on a scholarship, um, have everything go towards a major. And then two, you're not going to figure out what the, the heck you want to do until you're in your thirties anyway. So it's best to learn as much as you can about as many different things as you can. And so that put me on a path. You're there every summer and winter, taking three credits, you're taking six credits, you you know, Mm-hmm. that I ended up completing majors for marketing, for finance and for process management and consulting. And so I never took any 500 level classes. I Like I was never as deep as the deepest finance person, deep as the deepest marketer, deep as the deepest process management person. But I knew enough about all of those things that I could outcompete them on a broader playing field. And I think that says a lot too about yeah. like what attracted me to Bitcoin um, after that, I just started to become a voracious learner, a, a voracious um, reader. And so I've got like hundreds, maybe thousands of books here in my house. Um, maybe not thousands, but maybe a thousand, somewhere close to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I started getting around entrepreneurs, like the first guy I worked for sold his company to, you know, uh, Salesforce for two and a half billion dollars. Um, and so I started to see like a different level of thinker, a different level of leader. And the Bitcoin community, like what I think got me into it is I started to listen to Andreas Antonopoulos and listen to Stefan Levera's podcast way back in 2017. I just started to open up into a different sphere of Austrian economics, of this battle that's happening behind the scenes. It's always been happening, but I never knew it was there. It's like the Diagon Alley of like our world this battle that's happening like behind this brick wall that's always been there that we never knew was there the whole time. And so I started to learn and dig in about money and and it was just a different level for me to learn at. And that's what really led me into Bitcoin. Like I got into Bitcoin, honestly, through trying to build the best portfolio in an office portfolio competition. And I ended up I not, buying Bitcoin. I did not know that. We had, it was killing us in returns. Um. <laughs> and so I just bought it just to uh, keep up with him and his portfolio. But then, like, I started figuring out what it was. And then I dove down the rabbit hole. And it just encouraged me, like, you rise to the level. It's hard to it's hard to be it if you don't see it. And I think there's so many excellent people in Bitcoin. I talk about being at Swan is like, I'm Kevon Looney. And, you know, we've got a bunch of Stephs and Clays and Draymonds running around. You know, mm-hmm. I'm happy to get four rings, but it's like surrounding yourself with great people really elevates your game, your level of thinking. And I think the Bitcoin community at large has helped me to think deeper in more areas of my life than I ever have before. So, you know, all the way through, I think once I figured out to surround yourself with like people that are better than you at different topics and then go broad has really served me well in terms of mentors and reading and learning. Yeah. And it's, it goes back to, you know, it's biblical, obviously. Right. I mean, surround your, you know, show me your friends. I'll show you what kind of person you are, stuff like that. Right. You become who you surround yourself with. And that's something that, you know, clearly at Swan, you guys do a great job of that, of, you know, bringing in great people, whether it's, you know, at, you know, employees or uh, content, you know, producers, whatever it is, you know, that's, you guys have done a phenomenal job of that. So it, that definitely shows um, in that vein, I was going to ask you, you know, kind of what, what you're, what are you reading now and kind of who are you looking at each day? Like when you wake up, uh, but before I get to that though, what did you, the, the guy that sold, uh, for two and a half billion dollars, I remember you telling me that uh, months and months ago, and I don't remember if we talked about this or not, but what, what was a, a lesson or what did you kind of learn? What were some like the ahas from him, you know, share any and any and all kind of ahas learning from someone like, like that. Uh, I think for him, um, one, I mean, it was super gracious, him and a guy named Jim Brown, who I'm always super thankful for, because, you know, I'm just a guy, when you do sports, you're like way behind the eight ball in terms of internships, real world experience, like, because you're, you're working out, like, you're like lifting a barbell, like, you're not, that you're is not, a work, uh, yeah, yep. yeah, you're not, you're not digging in in Excel, like, 
for three months yep. for free at some company, right? Uh, and so he said, you could figure, you could work for me while you figure out what you want to do with your life. So one, that was a really gracious mm-hmm. thing. I think the thing that I learned from Chris, uh, Chris Baggett is his name, is he only needs one insight to go all in on something. And so his insight for this company here, one of the biggest exits of all time called Exact Target, was he was affiliated and owned, I think, a bunch of dry cleaners. Um, And he figured out that if we didn't get someone back in the door, I think it was like 1.7 times, then they never come back again. Right. It was, there was a certain number that he hit. They mm-hmm. just ran some analysis. And so he started to run coupons or wanted to do coupons at scale to all of the people that came into his dry cleaners. And so that's how he came up with this idea of, oh, I need to build a scalable email marketing solution. And he started with mm-hmm. dry cleaners and then he went to pizza chains. And then he said, there's a real company here. 13 years later, you know, they go public. And then a year after that, they get bought for two and a half billion dollars. But it was only one insight. Right, one first mm, principle wow. problem that he had to solve that led him to the success that he had, and I'm sure he, he built a great team, great culture. There's a lot of stuff, in right? That story. Yeah, and then his next company, even now, like he's like the whole problem he saw with food kitchens and whatnot was basically you end up with a problem where the drivers, the restaurant, and the people all have different incentives. The person wants uh, food that's hot. Right. The restaurant wants to, um, you know, keep their kitchen busy and have good margins. And then the driver wants to earn like a livable wage. And so they all had different problems. So the issues that he sees with the door dashes and the other things is that there's a broken incentive model that ends up increasing the cost for all three players. And so he just started to create his own vertically integrated kitchen where he hires their own drivers. They make their own food. They build their own technology. And literally, as all of these people are complaining about the $10 service fee on their DoorDash order, like his little uh, company, it's called Cluster Truck, is just growing and growing and growing and growing. And so he saw one problem, didn't do anything in the food or the food service business. But like, I guarantee you in 10 years, like he's going to have another billion dollar exit. And all he needs is one insight. And that's enough for him to invest. And so that's probably the biggest learning that I learned from him. Wow. That is, that is, that is very cool. Um, so in saying that we just touched on a second ago, what are, what are you reading now? Some of the books, I mean, I love, I was just listening to Jim Rohn this morning. I always make a little one, uh, going to school, whoever's with, driving with me in school, there are two school in the morning. It's gotta be 15 minutes of Jim Rohn or Bob Proctor or somebody at least, <laughs> um, <laughs> Earl Nightingale or something like that, Napoleon Hill. <laughs> Um, so, you know, he talks about readers are, you know, leaders are readers. Right. And, uh, so I, I love that you're same, same with me. I mean, I, my Jessica gives me crap all the time about the books, you know, showing off and, you know, just, you know, like, so what are you Kindle, reading right the now? Amazon, the Kindle, Kindle yeah, gets it's... Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I love the physical book just because I'm like, well, what if they like, you know, take all the books off the internet, you know, or like, what if they like are censoring <laughs> the books? Like, like they have been the last few years. Like, what if they're doing, I need the physical thing. Like, um, so that's always my excuse. At least that's what I tell my wife. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, what do you, what are you reading right now? Like, what do you, what do you, that also coupled with, what are you looking at each day? Is I know, like I was talking to John, you know, you know, he, he was just like, ah, I love you know, reading Lynn Alden. Like he's like, I got to kind of check up on a few different people each day. What are you reading right now? Just in general, is it fiction, nonfiction stuff? And then what are you looking at when it turns, when it comes to like business stuff or like, if you're looking for Bitcoin news or kind of current events, what are you looking at? So I guess both ends of the spectrum, what are you kind of tapping into to stay informed and stay on top of stuff? Yeah, I think um, the podcast that I've been subscribed to for the longest um, is a podcast called The Founders Podcast, a guy named David Sinra. Uh, and I think they're part of the Colossus Media Network now, but he does, he just reads biographies um, from, you know, entrepreneurs, business leaders, um, world figures that lived and built these great things hundreds of years ago. And like from their own words, like what lessons can you learn from them? And so I learned like, Now, like reading a book about, you know, some guy who has some new novel approach to like automate some random thing that's a problem from like 10 days ago, I I probably like don't buy those like I used to. I just go listen to the guy who figured something out in like 1800, Um, like, you know, Sam Edsel, uh, who basically built out the entire electric grid um, here in America and like how he did that how he created financing structures and company structures to do that. And he figured out a hard problem. And so I want to figure out from like those people 
that long before that do that. That's probably one thing that I read in terms of books, biographies, more so than like how-to books. Um, in terms of Bitcoin news and other things, like the SWAN team, it, it's so interesting. Our Slack channel, um, like our internal team Slack has more signal in it than probably anywhere else like in the world. There's so many interesting ideas and articles and things that come through there. And so honestly, I'm a, I'm probably a little bit luckier than other folks because we're, we're, we're putting on some sort of spaces or some other thing where our team is curating and aggregating all of the most critical and important news from things that are open source to uh, legal cases that are going to be relevant to energy, you know, issues around the world, um, to all sorts of things that like it's sort of easier for me to see and keep up with literally all of the latest stuff in one place. So I would probably say I'm not like a good person to to ask about that. I would say um, one person um, that I do like listen to and read probably more so than other people and how I relate this back to history. So um, I'll write a big piece on this. Uh, but what can I learn about microstrategy and whether or not I should invest in the equity of microstrategy? And again, this isn't financial advice. Um, go do the work, go do the reading yourself. But there's a company called Naspers. Um, they're the largest company in Africa. They're a traditional newspaper company. And in 2000, they brought in a leader named Koos uh, to be their president. And he saw the writing on the wall from the, the digital you know, takeover of the internet. And so they were a newspaper company and a wow. cable television company that it bought, you know, invested $32 million into Tencent. And they were a $150 million company at the time. And their holding in Tencent is now worth $200 billion. And so in light of seeing the enterprise value of newspapers going away, they took their cash flow from their existing business, like MicroStrategy, right? And they said, hey, we're going to take it and we're going to put it in this new thing that we know that's going to be the future. It's not going to kill our business if it doesn't go to where it is, but it will be materially impactful if it does. And so microstrategy is, to, is just the new NASPERS, right? But if you're not a student of history, you don't know about NASPERS, you wouldn't have the same confidence investing in microstrategy as other people would. And so that's just like, how does history blend with the current news and how does it inform the decisions that you make? Um, that is sort of, uh, that's a way that I think I could try to connect all the pieces there. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I, I love your just like, approach. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to like even ask you that. I mean, like, wh where, do, where do you think you're like, uh, you're just your mind? I don't know if it's in, uh, how would you explain your mind, but like just an analytical mind, but just uh, uh, like I think of my mind, my mind can see like patterns from like a long time ago and see them now. Um, what do you think? I'm just curious to see how you think your mind works. And cause this is fascinating to me, just human psychology, uh, human psychology, and just kind of how people are looking at things and problem solving, critical thinking. Um, but the way I feel like you have that ability to kind of see something from the past or something that you had seen before and kind of relate it to the future or kind of see these patterns. I mean, how do you, how would you explain your mind, I guess, and kind of how it works? Like, I think it's fascinating. Cause you, this is like the fifth example you showed where it's like, you know, something in the past, you were able to relate it to something in the future, but not everyone can do that. Man, it, it, history doesn't repeat; it rhymes. And I think, I mean, you look you look at the Bible, right? Um, a lot of people will disagree. They they get so focused on the points, right? Mm -hmm. You go back to you read the Old Testament of the Bible, and people are like, "Well, how can this be the true story of humanity and how humanity acted?" and oh, that's not right that a king like David would cheat on his wife or people would have multiple wives and 50 wives mm -hmm. and this and that. And, and you look around the world and you're like, mm, yeah, that's King Solomon. That's King Saul. That's King David. That's this. You're like, yep. these are the same people as today. Yep. So people like, I think, get so offended by the things that they might read in the Bible that they neglect to see the the sinful patterns of human nature and human psychology repeating themselves. And so I've just learned to, I think, take whatever I'm experiencing local, like what I would call a local maximum. It's so big and it's the craziest thing ever, unprecedented, right? That's how we all feel personally, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whenever yeah. we read some news, we're dealing with some, you know, crappy politician like Donald Trump or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And you can like literally always look back 
there was a person 500 years ago saying the same thing that you're saying now, literally. So, so training my mind to now that I've learned from like, you know, even training myself in the Bible or other things or other areas. Hey, how did this thing that happened 2000 years ago, 5000 years ago in this empire with these people, like, how do I not just look at that as an outside person? How do I insert myself into that story? And then by inserting myself into that story, right? Not, I mean, that's arrogance, right? Oh, only those people would do that. Like, right? Like we're more sophisticated than that. No, you're not. Uh, you're a person in the crowd and you're going to be making either the decision of the winning side or the losing side. And it's up for you to decipher with wisdom, like what side I need to be on, what decision do I need to make or how would I make this decision if I was presented these circumstances? And so that's what I like. I think I'm just like, um, I'm, I'm a looping, uh, I, I think in patterns, I think in loops. Um, and I try to train myself. I don't do it perfectly because you think the thing that you're dealing with is something that no one else has dealt with before. Yeah. The variables are different, but overall, right. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. And so how do you respond in that? Is there, is there a like analogy from the past that I can use to help me in my current situation? So interesting. And it, it, again, it brings me back to Jim Rohn. I feel like we're listening to Jim Rohn right now, man. Oh man. It's uh, it's just, you know, the, he has a story of like the a guy it was from uh, standard oil. It was like 40, 50 years ago. And he's like, yeah, the guys brought me in and there was, you know, they're at a conference table and he's just like, you know, so Jim, like, you know, a lot of, you know, influential people around the world. And uh, we thought you might have some insight into what the eighties are going to be like. And he was like, yes, gentlemen, I, I do know a lot of people around the world. And he's like, you know, they leaned in and he's like, I'll tell you exactly what the eighties are going to be like a lot like the seventies, you know, <laughs> like it, he's like, it's just, it's, it's opportunity and chaos or, you know, opportunity and chaos. it's just, it's, it's always like, Hey, it was spring or summer is there. And then it's fall and then it's winter and then it's spring, you know, like it's just the cycles of life is exactly what you just kind of outlined. It's so, it's so brilliant. I mean, to your point, we get caught up in this minutia instead of just zooming out and realizing like, Hey, these are just patterns. These are things that are just going to happen and you can't fight it. It's just the sun rises in, in the East and sets in the West. Don't fight it. <laughs> like yeah. don't spend time fighting that. So yeah, yeah it's brilliant. Said. Um, transitioning yeah. a little bit to, uh, to, you know, Bitcoin, what do you think is, is the one thing that, uh, you know, people need to get, or even on your travels, when you're traveling around, talking to people, talking to, you know, business, uh, you know, leaders and, and entrepreneurs and different stuff. What's the thing that you think that people grapple with the most and you know, trying to tackle with their mind and wrapping their mind around Bitcoin? Uh, it could be like even something that the, the things in the beginning when you were kind of like, ah, you know, you're kind of questioning it and trying to learn it. Uh, what is that, that pattern, I guess, we're talking, speaking of patterns, what do what do you see with people and the things they maybe have the most problems with or the, the important things people need to really understand about Bitcoin? Wow. I think um, we are building in Bitcoin. We are, um, I, I think Satoshi Nakamoto in, in the best that he could built a system that works uh, because it mimics and reflects reality and nature. And so let's take last week or this week's debacle with the, uh, with the mempool and the fees, right? Mm -hmm. Like having uh natural economic factors drive markets is healthy. So everyone for like three days were complaining about this is why Bitcoin doesn't work. The fees are more than the actual, you know, uh, subsidy fee that they're going to get for, for mining a new block. Like people were complaining. But what does that do? If the fees are too high, that's going to drive more innovation into Lightning. It's going to drive more people building scalable solutions on layer two and if more if the fees are too high in Bitcoin, it's not that your transaction's not going to go through. It's how fast do you want it to go through? Do you want it on the next block or we, are you willing to wait a, an hour or two for your yeah. transaction to be confirmed and picked up into the next block? And so those are the things that I think people grapple with all of these things. Well, if there's a fixed supply, well, how will there be lending? How will there, how will there be credit? Like, how will our system actually work? And when you look out at nature, growth and creative destruction never stops. It just grows and decelerates at the rate of constraint that it's given. 
And so let me give an example, like trees, like they don't stop growing. Like if there aren't enough nutrients, if there aren't enough sunlight, they hunker down. Like they just don't grow as fast. It's like the goldfish story. You put goldfish in water that's warmer than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. They grow super fast. Their cells expand way faster. You put them in 70 degree water, they grow at a normal pace. You put them in cold water initially and they grow way slower. But the ones that went in cold water starting off, they live 30% longer than the ones that grew too fast. And so they say, well, you say that innovation is bad. I don't say that innovation is bad. Innovation isn't bad. Innovation at the speed that we can handle is the right speed of innovation. And so when you talk about AI, I have no problem with AI. The problems that we have with AI today are that AI and the investments that we've made into these technologies because of 0% interest rates have grown faster than our capability to build the skills to offset AI. So it's going to displace all these jobs. It's because we never built up the skill set to properly complement the AI that we have. Why? Because of free money. Not that AI wasn't going to happen, not that innovation wasn't going to happen. And so people talk about, well, how are we going to expand? How are we going to build new develop buildings? How are we going to develop new property? We will. We just won't have new properties, new buildings, and new expansion every day, every week. It will grow at the constraints that are placed upon it. And when we get true productivity gains, true breakthroughs in innovation, where we're able to produce something for twice as much as we were before, that's where the productivity increases off of true innovation. And you know what? When you read all those books, true innovation only came from constraint or creative destruction. They don't come from an abundance, right? More people have died from yep. gluttony than from lack. And so yeah. that's that's my biggest thing with like Bitcoin, like and people that are grappling with Bitcoin, they have all these questions about how could we operate on a fully fractional reserve system and credit will be lent out when there's great opportunities to lend it when people that have excess and people that have needs there's always a market for people to trade will it trade 24 7 all around the clock i don't know but does it need to that's the question that we all need to answer do we need to be like the goldfish that was put in water that was too warm and we die 40 percent slower than the goldfish that started out slower and had natural constraints. Yeah. Well said, dude. Well said. I know we got to get rolling here in a few minutes. So we got a couple to, to wrap up there. There's just so much to unpack there again. We'll, you know, in a month or something like that, we'll, we'll do this again and unpack this some more. I mean, it's just, there's so much. Here. I love, I love the answer because everyone answers it differently too. I mean, what you said is so brilliant and everyone's got a different answer. I mean, some people talk about the math of Bitcoin. Some people talk about, you know, politics. Some people talk about whatever of Bitcoin. And um, I, I think what you hit on there is super important because it is a question that does come up a lot of the credit thing. And, and like you said, the growth will happen, but it will be built on a solid foundation. And, and what we have done with the money itself of pulling debt into the future, pulling prosperity into the future now, it's built on this unstable foundation, not just the actual money itself, but then not actually the, the actual development, the the buildings built on quicksand, things that are crumbling, bridges that are crumbling, things that are crumbling because they're not, they're not built properly the incentives weren't aligned right. so they're they're poor incentives now the things are crumbling or whatever so brilliantly said and it's something that needs to be talked about and explained much more so we'll uh we'll have to unpack that over time because that is just not talked about enough um in transitioning here you know towards the end uh been asking everyone just a little bit of like again a little bit of the politics in, in bitcoin i guess if you will or the founding so the founding documents of, of america versus the white paper um you know, I, I believe that you kind of had like, you know, the Bible and then you had, you know, maybe Magna Carta will say, but then you had the American you know founding documents and then you have the Bitcoin white paper. It's kind of like this logical progression to me, at least in my, my bias, um, my narrative. Um, what do you think of the bigger, um, role to play in the future going forward, the, the founding documents in, in America or the Bitcoin white paper? And again, it's a little bit apples and oranges possibly, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is uh this is an interesting debate. Uh rules without rulers, um, I think is an idea that um has a lot of weight and it has a lot of merit. And um 
I did, I mean, in, in writing this, I wrote this, I think I still have this thing in my, uh, uh, let me see if I can pull this up because I do have like some thoughts off of this. Um, and give me one, one moment to read something that I've written and then we could probably, we could probably uh, in there. Um, because I think it, it articulates my thoughts in a way, um, that, I mean, hopefully are helpful to people, um, in articulating like what is Bitcoin. So let me just see if I yes. can well, really fast. Yeah, while while you're looking for it too, the other thing I kind of wrap on is do, do people believe, and, and I ask every person this, I've been asking people a lot in general, uh, just you know, socially or whatever, do you believe that freedom comes from the way you live or from your government? And that's kind of like this 1A, 1B question I kind of ask at the end of you know, what comes first, is the fish or the, the chicken or the egg, right? So it's kind of like that other part of that you can you can think about and kind of even elaborate on too. So, right. so th this is, I said, this is related to Bitcoin in the Bible, since you mentioned both of those things. I said, mm -hmm. can there be a creator who created a dynamic protocol designed to be opinionated and exclusive that is also openly free and freely available to all who would accept it, that has its source code available for all to debate or disagree with, that is objectively true and unchangeable at its core, but was also designed to be advanced and co-built by others that will come after its creator? That is inevitable and cannot be stopped. That was birthed and expanded through a small group of people in direct opposition to current authorities. That is maintained and defended by a disruptive, subversive group of individuals who live countercultural lifestyles to the current trends. That the majority of people believe is not valuable and primitive in its foundations in favor of new modern operating systems. That is impossible to unsee and keep hidden once its true properties have been experienced, tasted, seen, and understood. That is sometimes imperfectly presented by those who in love for others desperately want to warn their family, friends, and loved ones about the impending destruction coming to the current system. Yes, I believe there can be a, such a creator. Yes, I believe there can be such a protocol. And similarly, how no Bitcoiner would ever deny the reality and existence of, or, of a creator or creators named Satoshi Nakamoto, I cannot in my deepest core, core deny that there is a God and an original creator of such a system. I don't believe the Bible and Bitcoin are contrary to be, beliefs to be adopted separately from one another. Similarly, I do not believe the presence of the Christian God and science and scientific discovery are at odds. However, I want to be clear and send a message to all those that believe that sound money will save you and it's the thing you desire most. It cannot and will not. Okay? Something is broken. You don't know what it is or why it is, but you know deep down in your soul that there's something more. I would say that my savior is, is the preceding creator of this dynamic protocol. I put my trust in him. But diving into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin, I can clearly see how mortal humans can create beautiful things that regularly remind me of the original creator of this beautiful type of system. So I pray that I don't make the mistake of worshiping the created thing over the creator of it all. So I believe that, like, again, Bitcoin is just mimicking other systems that are beautifully designed, uh, openly and freely available yet opinionated and exclusive, uh, designed to be changed at its core. That's kind of the foundation of like the founding documents, what they did. Hey, we want to give a blueprint, but we know that there's people after us who will need to change it. We know that we need to put limitations and um, limits onto the people that will use this system because they're going to abuse that power, right? Bitcoin has those same limiters, right? That's proof of work, right? The Bible has those same, you know, call outs. Hey, greed, power, lust, like those things are mm -hmm. going to be limiting factors for you and they're going to destroy you. And so there's like rules that the universe operates on. Uh, there's rules that Bitcoin operates on. There's rules that the founding documents were built upon. And I think uh, we would be wise to uh, stay to those design principles. Um, and so I believe like which one is adhering to those things more and better now? It's Bitcoin than it is our founding documents because we've kind of moved away from um, absolute power and absolute control and manipulating the constitution and all of those other documents. Um, do we desire freedom? Yeah. The, I mean, do we desire freedom? What's Is it the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you believe the freedom comes from the way you live your life or does it come from someone else? Is it the, you know, government granting you freedom? Mm. Um, I, I would say... Uh, that we were not designed to be our own rulers. And I would say that in that paradigm, we seek justice. 
And so we've created imperfect mechanisms to create people who would uphold justice. If someone were to come running down the street today and, you know, um, heaven forbid, God forbid, like hit, hit, one, hit you with a car, right? Mm -hmm. Your family would seek justice, right? We want justice. It's not wrong mm -hmm. for that guy to just keep going. What do you mean we're going to let that person just kind of go out there and live their own lives? There's something internally wrong with that. And so we've created and manufactured our own ways of creating systems that implement justice. We desire freedom, but we desire uh, justice at the same time. And uh, there's imperfect ways that we do that. I think the core desire is freedom. I think our imperfect mechanism is government. And so we're trying to get back to that right sizing of freedom in government, which I think we're we're way over swung to the government side, which I think you would agree with. Oh, boy. Yeah. Another whole rabbit hole to go down, <laughs> which we won't today. Today, we will not. Yeah. Well, well said. Um, boy, uh, there's just I think that's a beautiful place to end it. Where? Um, well, first off, where did, did you publish that somewhere? I mean, I love what you just read was awesome. Is that on you know Swan site or do you have that somewhere or what? I have it on. Uh, I think I have it on my LinkedIn profile somewhere. Uh, Man. But yeah, it was that's just like awesome. Book, but. Okay, yeah, because that that is awesome, awesome, awesome stuff there. Um, so you know, would love to have that share it out whatever that's that is too cool what are you guys you know you um swan what are you guys working on right now what's coming what's got you fired up what project are you working on uh currently yeah i think the project that um we're really excited about um we we want to keep seeing more adoption of it it's nakamoto portfolio.com i mean honestly we're just releasing cool. in you know half of our cio cio we're just releasing tools to allow people to make fact-based decisions, data-driven decisions about whether Bitcoin should be a part of your strategy. And I mean, I was on a, did a thing the other day, like Tether just released their, um, you know, their their reserve, you know, transparency report. And they show they had 1.83% Bitcoin um, as part of their reserve strategy. And they have a $1.44 billion surplus. Um, I think having a robust treasury management strategy is more important now than it ever has been. So it's like, it's helping companies to see in a cash-based, short-duration-based uh, portfolio, Bitcoin should have a place. Like, it doesn't have to be 10%. It doesn't have to be 5%, but it should be more than zero. And the numbers and the data bear that out. So getting more people on the Nakamoto portfolio, building out portfolios for people to go and see and say, how does Bitcoin perform? I think it's the number one thing we're most excited about is we're helping businesses think about their strategy right now. Too cool. I will, you know, link to Swan obviously in the description here, and uh, it's an incredible company for anyone anyone looking to get you know buy Bitcoin obviously or get uh, educated, you know, which is the the other part of this, which is the the massive key to Bitcoin adoption. Obviously, getting to the the what three percent, you know, getting to ten million people, the uh, just like the Revolutionary War, right? Getting to the the three percent of, of of people, the ten million Bitcoiners, uh, so we can have this hyper Bitcoiners world of freedom. So. Where where can we find you, brother? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dante underscore uh, underscore Cook one, um, and you can find me on LinkedIn at Dante Cook. Love it, love it. The one thing before we wrap here, really quick, I was just just hit me. It was uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more with the the Bitcoin you know the white paper versus you know the founding documents, just because uh, we were somewhere we were talking about this the other day. But Bitcoin is global, and the and the founding documents are are local. Um, you know, so maybe America, they might have, but if you're in, you know, Thailand, the founding documents of America can't help you very much. Uh, yeah. so I think that's why Bitcoin, I agree. I think Bitcoin will be, you know, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> go ahead. I, mean, that's, I love that. That's a, that's a different, I, I hadn't gone there, but that's, that's fire. Uh, yeah. You have, you have to be in a sovereign mm -hmm. land somehow, some way to have the founding documents affect you. So I think that's where it's minimized, right? Like that impact is going to be minimized unless your country adopts it somehow, unless your leaders adopt it. Where Bitcoin Yo, that's a, That is a bomb. Uh, that's a fire insight that I just hadn't considered. We'll pour in this more next time. I appreciate you so much, dude. Uh, there's so many things to continue talking about, which uh, I wish you would record all of these. You're one of the smartest dudes out there, uh, truly. The way you think about things, there's just, you know, 
I love all the people in the Bitcoin space and you learn something from every single person, but you, uh, I can't wait for your pod to, to really get rolling and stuff because you have a lot to share, brother, and uh, it needs to be heard. So I appreciate you coming on here so much. All right. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Hi, Brandon. Holy cow. Wow. What a session. Uh, Dante, truly one of the smartest people I know, one of the deepest thinkers. And uh, there's... <laughs> I learned a lot, let's just say that. I learned a lot speaking to Dante and that never ceases to amaze me because he always is imparting wisdom and I always learn something after talking to him. So the, the coolest part about uh, John Har and Brian DeMint and Dante and Michelle Weekly and so many people, they're so young. And that is so amazing to see because so many of the problems we have nowadays are started by and, and caused by people running the country right now in academia, in politics, uh, in the banking institutions, and quite honestly, they're all run by people that are older. And it's not to say that older people are bad or anything, but because uh, I can't stand when people say, okay, boomer. It's one of the things, my biggest pet peeves in, in the Twitter sphere and in, in the cultural trends of, of today. However, when you get to see young people and the integrity and the morality, the ethics, the, the intellectual prowess they have and the young people that are coming up, boy, boy oh boy, America, American values, freedom, liberty, sound money, Bitcoin could not be in better hands and is anything but what the mainstream tells you. So I appreciate you joining in on this. Please let us know what else you would like us to talk about in the future with Dante, who else you would like to see and who else we should have on here. And please go follow Dante as well. He works at Swan Bitcoin. Please go follow him because he's truly one of the smartest people as you can see in this space. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one.